Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for coming along to this. We've got a fabulous panel of incredibly um, uh, wired and uh, connected and innovative people. Uh, do excuse me if I take a phone call in the middle of this session because I'm in the middle of editing a piece for tonight's 10 o'clock news. <laughs> and I think, I think it's on track. I left it uh, at 6 o'clock with, with all the script laid down but uh, some of the pictures still to arrive. So, um, you know, um, a bit of multitasking here. Um, it's going to be fairly free form. We've got, we've got a, four people with different perspectives on the use of uh, some of this technology in, um, in all sorts of protest situations. And uh, some of them come at it from... Uh, more of a, a, a technology point of view, others from a more journalistic point of view. Um, but I think we're trying to give you a bit of background on, on what sort of uh, technology is out there and the pitfalls in how it can be used and some of the sort of ethical issues that are increasingly coming to the fore here. And what I'm going to do is, is take us uh, through each of the four uh, panelists with their different views. And, and try and get them not just to be kind of theoretical, but maybe, unfortunately, we haven't got any means of displaying what they've got on their phones and so on, but try and get a bit of um, show and tell involved there uh, from each of them. And then uh, we'll have a bit of a chit-chat between ourselves, but I want this to be a pretty interactive session and quite rapidly to get into contributions from the floor and any experiences you've got of using this various technology. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with Christian Payne, who um, is, I've always known as Documentally, um, who is an amazingly uh, adept early adopter of just about anything that comes along. Any, any new form of social media or app or whatever, uh, Christian will be playing around with and, and complaining about and um, using in innovative ways and then showing other people in a very caring, sharing way um, how they can best be adopted. So, Christian, how, how long have you been playing with this stuff? I think for me, um, it was about building the networks first, um, building a way of getting information from my device in front of people um, and it wasn't so much as the apps it as mashing together things like stills and audio and putting them on YouTube because although that's where I get the most death threats that's also where the eyes are um, so just just but spooling back what do you do just tell me what it's what I was a, a photographer for the, for the, the dailies and I got mm. frustrated um, with the amount of um, editors between my images and then the final piece of work. So I decided to go to Iraq kind of on a holiday. Uh, and, and when was this? This was 2005 during the war. Right. Uh, so I could only fly into Turkey on a holiday <laughs> and then caught a taxi into Iraq. And while I was there, um, it was very, there was very little around. YouTube had just been born, 2005, I believe. 2005, yeah. Uh, and so for me, I was using film, very long-winded, converting the, the film um, into digital format. When you say film, you mean as video? In, no, 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 actually, you mean, you mean as in 35mm film 35 in a mil film, film camera. Even though there were digital cameras around, um, I, power is always a big issue. If you remember apps and technology, power is a massive issue. M myself and yourself, iPhone users, have serious cases because there's nothing worse than having all the technology and no way to power it. So for me, I thought I'll go as analog as possible. As far as um, I was into geotagging for a safety measure there. So for me, it was I actually had a GPS device, which I would text home the coordinates. Every time I was blindfolded and taken to a new place, I would look down and write secret base one. Hold text. on, hold on, spool back. Why were you being, who was blindfolding you? <laughs> Every time I was I tell blindfolded. really good stories yeah. online, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was the Kurdish Peshmerga mostly taking me to different um, camps along the Iranian border. They wanted to kind of show off what they had and, and what they were doing. So they didn't want me to obviously see 
where they were, so I'd be blindfolded. But the technology wasn't necessarily around. I had a dumb phone. Um, but by texting my coordinates home, I knew that my last position would always be um, noted, so that if I did go missing, people might, if they cared. And that was a you had a GPS unit with you? I'd have a GPS you... unit right. and a phone and a film camera. It wasn't until uploading that video after the newspapers only printed a couple of photographs that I realised, hang on a second, I can completely bypass the mainstream media now. And that's when the app started kind of coming. That's when Twitter um, was born in 2006. And I suddenly thought, wow, this could be a backbone. This could be a spine for all of my content. I went on to work in, for the United Nations on a project um, as the refugees came out of Iraq into Jordan. And video conversation apps enabled me to bridge <sighs> Iraqis. What's a, 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 what's a video conversation app? So uh, at the time there was a platform called Seismic which was asynchronous. I'd record a video of what I'm doing and then somebody would respond. But when I'm sat in a, in a cafe in Amman with an Iraqi refugee, kind of interviewing him and chatting to him and then sending this into the interwebs, there were people having their breakfast in America going, <gasps> he's talking to an Iraqi and he's not a terrorist. The news at the time was just talking about how we must hate these people. So for me, the power of bridging that gap and showing a kind of humane link through a laptop uh, was really important. And now the more things get mobile, the more we're able to share from these places. Not so long ago in, in um, Africa, I was working with the Kenyan Wildlife Service and there was 3G everywhere. And I was really impressed that in the middle of Savo, I could film, edit, and upload a video on an iPad, which is the only device I chose to take. I'm stuck with Apple, unfortunately. And that kind of opened my mind to working fast and light and using the apps that I became familiar with to send so it to give, the give us a So give us a picture of the kind of technology you are, you are now using on that, that sort of For me, trip. power is vital. So I would have a, a folding solar panel called a, a power film. Um, which also has a slight battery backup in it. So through the day, I could use the, the sun's energy to charge my devices, and if there's a quiet moment just for a second, I'll be charging so my you've devices. So you've got a solar panel. What other devices do you have with you? iPhone in a battery case, so that I have at least 24 hours. Um, so the, I charge the phone as normal at night, but it charges the phone first, then the case. Then when the phone's flat, I flick a switch, and it charges the phone. Um, because you can never rely on 3G on the SIM that you have in there. I have a, um, a couple of mobile um, I love it when people bring props. This MiFi hotspots. So yeah. for me, I've got an unlocked one of these when you, I'm in, a, um, in a Africa. Mi a MiFi. A MiFi. I I'll can buy a minute. local SIM card. 10 pounds will probably last me a week of data. And you don't want to be using your roaming data. I put that SIM card in here, turn it on. I can connect five devices to the 3G network, so my phone, an iPad, someone else's laptop, I can share it, it's quite a social thing, and, um, and that ensures that I'm not draining my battery too heavily on my <coughs> mobile device as well. So you've got, you've got uh, a phone, you've got a mobile broadband device, you've got an i you're editing on an iPad, I'm, you're saying? I switch between iPad and, and a very lightweight <coughs> um, netbook, like a MacBook Air or something like that, because sometimes if you want to edit HTML, until recently when the app Blogsy came out, if you wanted to format interesting text and embed links, um, it was very difficult to do on an iPad, but now the apps are coming out. So I use Blogsy on an iPad if I really want to strip things down. It used to be hard to get your photos, video, and data from mobile devices into the iPad, but it's getting easier. I loathe to be mentioning so many Apple products because they're very much closed. They make it very difficult for people to get innovative outside of their own mm. infrastructure. Well, that's what I was moving on to ask. I mean, that kind of infrastructure you've got with you, it sounds like a brilliant, you know, uh, compact toolkit. Um, I also have an audio recorder I use as backup because for me, um, audio's Audio is a wonderful, wonderful way to tell a story. And quite often, if I've got a phone stuck in somebody's face, they're trying to protect their identity, or they feel uncomfortable by that, I can instead put a recorder on the table and say, let's have a conversation. And that, with, combined with photographs, I was told by the UN, 
um, record these stories, but do not give away people's identity. So with photography, I could hide people's faces behind a kettle or as they turned away, and by recording audio interviews with them, I could then create what looked like a video, easily digestible by everybody on YouTube, but it was a photo <coughs> slideshow. And I think it was a lot more powerful than force-feeding video down someone's eyes. Now, that toolkit is, is available to you. It's still a very expensive toolkit. Mm -hmm. You can do it all what, with a mobile What, what is available to... Um, people in sort of uh, difficult parts of the world that want to get their stories out? That might be a good question for witness, actually. I, I will bring, I'll come on to that, for, but for, what do you, what do you What think? I've come across is um, Nokia in Africa, for example, are all over the place, Motorola as well. Um, so we're not looking at the kind of latest and greatest smartphone devices. If I've been um, enabling people to document stories, we still have to, in many ways, in, in the more rural areas, rely on, here's a, um, I'll say Kodak-style flip camera, because it takes normal batteries, which are relatively easy to find or, char find or charge up, um, SD card, which is removable, because then they can take that card out, give it to someone, a courier, deliver it to someone who has a computer, edit that footage, and give them a blank card back. So that kind of technology can get stories, clips, video footage out of... Um, areas very, that very cheaply, as very well. cheaply. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, let's move on to uh, Sam Carlyle, um, who comes from different kind of background. You, you, you're basically a geek. You uh, are a, a dynamical geek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a proper geek. Um, and what's interesting here is that we are seeing the geeks and the hacks coming together here. Um, tell us about the app that you have specifically developed for use during, during protests? OK, so I'm the co-founder of uh, an app, a web app called uh, Suki. Uh, I co-founded that with a guy called Samuel Gauss. And the first concept came out of uh, some work we did at the UCL occupation uh, back in 2010. Um, essentially, um, it's intended to keep demonstrators safe, mobile, and informed during a demonstration. We're providing a service which essentially filters the conversations going on on Twitter, actually, Twitter Fall is a, is a great example of a tool which is going to pull together lots of um, different tweets and contributions around a theme, a topic, in this case the, the hashtag. Um, but it doesn't quite go far enough to actually give you a sense of relevancy, veracity, or even um, any kind of context awareness of what, you know, what the situation is. And there's no one really filtering or uh, looking through the stuff, uh, fact checking, and, and these are problems if you're trying to rely on this as a data source. And if you've been on a protest, the most battery draining thing you can do with your phone is, is run something like TweetDeck on, on frequent updates. There's a torrent of information coming through and you can't cope with it. What we've tried to do is take this kind of, this, this torrent of com this conversation that's going on online uh, and take the hashtags of the day, um, try and rank users' contributions, uh, you know, kind of, kind of karmically. Um, so if, if, you know, you start off with a, with a neutral kind of, you know, score, we're going to um, give you a sort of uh, thumbs up, a thumbs down. Um, in our messaging console if, if we think you're uh, providing relevant updates. But this is done in a way which is event-driven. So we're considering what actually happened, looking back to the tweets that were put out, and then sort of saying, OK, well, did, did this user get it right on the whole? Um, what this enables us to do is put out a, a series of updates which come through uh, the Atsuki data and the Atsuki SMS Twitter accounts. These are actually physically embodied in a web app, suki.org forward slash web app, um, which you can view. And we tried to just kind of hack the CSS, JavaScript, and HTML thing together to make it compatible for as many devices as possible. Um, so how, how many, what, what range of devices is this available on? So yeah. it works really badly on BlackBerry. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah. This is because you know BlackBerry doesn't do the sort of swipe gesture. Um, it, you can still get the overview and you can still kind of see the map at a glance and get the... So, so there's a map view, there's a reporting feature, um, and um, you get these digest updates in, the, in a little box at the top, uh, which is a sort of speech bubble coming out of the Suki's uh, head. Um, have, you, have you got... I, I know nobody will be able to see it, but let's just let's have a prop. OK, so... Um, that's so new. you've got it on, uh, on an Android device. Does that... Mm -hmm. does that um, does that show, you know, uh, a preference, as it were? Uh, is, 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 yeah, you, you can't take batteries out of iPhones. For yeah. me, this is the end of the game. If you didn't yeah. want to be yeah. tracked, if you wanted to replace your battery, yeah. uh, it costs. So actually, in this kind of you know ruggedness of tech and usefulness, um, yeah. that battery. Well, I've got another one. 
uh, with me here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, they cost five quid on eBay. So this, you know, I keep these topped up. I keep a stack in my pocket. Mm -hmm. When I want to go in a demo, and if I want that kind of full fat web experience, and I want to get all my updates as quick as possible, and do all my emails, and create a mobile hotspot, and you know, take photos and, and whatnot, then you know, you need you need you need spare batteries. Um, and it's I guess the proprietary accessories you have to buy to. So you is, know, Andro is Android, Android yeah. becoming the platform of protest, the, the preferred platform um, of protest? It empowers <laughs> developers and people because you can take, you, you, you have more control over the software you've installed on it. I choose to, to root my devices, which means I, it's all different, uh, an aftermarket firmware on them. Um, gives me access to some more advanced features. I can encrypt it's the whole explain, file system. Uh, that, I, I mean, I'm sure we've got varying levels of um, who technical here's got, Who here's got a rooted Android device or, or something like that? Okay, great. Okay, so not to iPhone. iPhone. Um, not that this is a, a, yeah. a war, but it's interesting. But we, um, did, we didn't talk about hacked iPhones, which... Mm. Yeah. So, mm. so if, you, if you didn't know already, the, one of the best things you could do with your uh, rooted uh, Google phone is to, if you were concerned about the privacy of your data, is you could route all of your traffic through um, an uh, anonymizing service. Or, you know, I mean, we were going to hear um, a little bit about the flavor of the uh, Orbot or the, you know, the Guardian project, probably from ObscuraCam, or maybe some of the other projects. Um, and you know these are things which empower you to, to preserve your anonymity and also to uh, make the best use of your device. But you can also enable modifications on your phones which would save battery life. And you know, I mean, that was a theme before. Yep. So, and these things are only possible after the device has actually been realised and actually into the marketplace, and then people start interacting with it and start using it. The issue it. for me is that there are so many different types of Android um, now. There's no single flavour, and that's one reason. I mean, I have an Android phone in my pocket. It's a quite a scary place going into the app store from a person who's used to the sterile, crisp, clean app store of everything massively policed. So for me, I, I, I'm drawn to this, even though I loathe Apple on sitting in their ivory tower, uh, looking down, telling us how we should use the internet. But there are more and more devices coming out. I use Covert Browser on the iPad. It's, it's effectively Tor, a basic version of the Onion router, so that if there is any blocked tweets which we're no doubt going to be finding soon from by regimes blocking this information mm -hmm. by using that app on the iPad even which I'm amazed it got through um, I can view from any country in the world technically um, so, so t just that, that's interesting tell us about covert browser it's so I have a VPN uh, plugged into the back of here as well a free VPN so that I can uh, t to a certain extent anonymize my use with this device providing I'm not using uh, certain apps, but Covert Browser is in the App Store. You can download it for one ninety nine, and then you can choose what country you want to appear in. I use it quite a lot for viewing American videos that aren't licensed over here, um, but also for projecting your location. Uh, the interesting thing about this is, you know, a lot of this language to a lot of journalists will be um, completely obscure. Are, are, the, are <laughs> we all, as journalists, going to have to learn? This kind of stuff. More, more, pro more for protesters who, who aren't protected by mm. their, you know, their newspapers or organisations. Because let's remember, it's the protesters who get pinged out in the field or out in their particular country who who will just vanish, and nobody's going to care about them quite often. So I think protecting identity ultimately you just don't take a phone out with you and if you have got an iPhone although I have done all these kind of paranoid experiments by turning it off and seeing if on a speaker it goes dick 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 and it never has but how do I know that it can't be remotely turned on I'm that tin hat wearing so for me I've even got a little lead bag that I used to hold film in through x-rays I'll drop the iPhone in there Mm. Right. Um, all I would say is that the the um, who's who's after you, Christian? I mean, <laughs> nobody yet. Touch wood. I'm. Um, the makers of these devices haven't necessarily considered your privacy or your uh, empowering you uh, through selling that device. It is not a concern for them. They want to create profit and uh, say so they uh, do particularly mean Apple in this case. It's very locked down. Um, it's really people jailbreaking and actually working to create aftermarket community firmwares that are already empowering you to do something different with the platform other than what it was originally intended to do, which means when you've got your indenture cost of £400 in your, in your shiny new phone, you can actually do something great with it afterwards. Um, you, know, and you should really be looking for these solutions and actually trying to influence or shape the development of those apps and those... Uh, do, they, but have, have journalists got the time to do this? I mean, a lot of journalists will. This this will be a very 
alien world. So a, a lot mm. of people just trying to do the basic work of getting getting stories out and. Mm. That's why we need to see work. more case studies, more mm. stories coming out mm. of how people so, uh, that's what are I was using come these on devices. Is, is this a kind of fringe activity? I mean, your, your, your app, it's been used by a few people in London. It's not being used a around the world yet, or is it? So operationally, it's difficult to redeploy what we're doing. I don't personally have the resources to be able to take uh, my idea to another country, what we've tried to do is make the code um, easy to redeploy so that any team of people uh, anywhere in the world could take the basic tools and recreate the service, which was relevant to their own community, their own context. Well, I'm very mindful of where we are this evening, and I'm thinking constantly to the Middle East and to um, uh, places where people really definitely need empowering and they need to uh, get hands on, their hands on a technology which would let them get their story out and let, let the crowd say, we see we know what's happening and uh, we're going to you know, look after ourselves by empowering each other with sharing of information. Um, and also kind of, this, this what you're offering safe. here as well, what you're offering here is, is not the silly tick we see on Twitter where a celebrity is verified. You're actually verifying news sources here and that's the serious role here for journalists. It is vital for journalists to get clued up when it comes to this kind of technology because it might be those guys sitting at home going, this is true, this is true, marking these people up so that we can go straight to a person and know that this isn't just some inflamed, oh, there's a riot on so-and-so yeah. street, and there isn't, you know. Which is a good opportunity to move on to our next contributor, uh, Tom Barfield, site editor, community manager at Demotics, which is a crowdsourced photojournalism uh, service. Uh, and what you're doing is, act, I mean, your, your, your motive is, you know, is, is, is not... It's not political. It's not. It's not even necessarily journalistic. It's. It's a. Com it's a commercial uh, platform aimed at, at giving um, citizen photographers, citizen journalists, a route to mainstream media and to get 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 paid for their work. Is that a fair summary? Um, yes and no. I mean, uh, we do sell a lot of photos, and that's how we support the business and how it keeps going. Um, but we also provide a platform for people to publish, publish their stories, even if they never get sold to a newspaper or to mm. a broadcaster. Um, those are on our website. We get um, one and a half billion or so hits a month um, of people reading all our stories from all over the world. Um, so what are, are you a news <coughs> organization? Are you uh, a technology business? Are you um, a citizen uh, empowerment service? How would you describe um, I suppose the best word for what we do is a platform. Um, mm. So we, we offer people a space to tell their stories um, through, through photos and through, um, they can also write articles to accompany them. Um, and we also offer um, news organisations a platform to come and find stories that they might not have content from because, as you're probably aware, um, uh, news organisations have less and less resources to maintain bureaus um, overseas. Um, in, in the vast majority of cases, so we provide um, a kind of reach and filling in the gaps as well for them. It's user-generated <laughs> content is the, the yep. kind of the, the, cl the cliche here, and that's in some ways got a bit of a bad reputation lately as being, you know, uh, unverifiable of um, sometimes of mixed quality. But, you, but um, that's that's. That's part of what you do, right? You yeah, that's um, in in a way we're kind of a filtering system, um, and you know there are other companies uh, in this space doing very similar things. Like Storyful is a good example. Um, they they hunt down uh, sort of where materials originating from. But um, what we do is um, we establish relationships pe with people and. We try and keep them with us for the long term rather than having sort of hit and run, I'll come and post a video or I'll come and post a few photos on your site and then you'll never hear from me again. We try and develop relationships with people. And this goes back to what you were saying earlier about um, is this really what, uh, are, do journalists really have time to do this? Mm. I think um, this is absolutely what journalists should be doing because this is what journalists have always done is develop contacts and develop relationships so, uh, so that they have trusted sources of information. Um, and uh, give, give us a few examples of, of, of how this is working. I mean, what, what sort of stories have, have, have come through Demotics and, and made it to a wider audience? 
Um, well, uh, do you remember the, um, the Ian Tomlinson case uh, when, uh, when a man was killed during the anti-G20 process here in London? Um, we had uh, some of the um, some of the photo, the only photos from the scene of him um, lying on the ground with the sort of with the crowd uh, drawing that. It would be lovely to put it up on the projector, but uh, we can't do that. Um, and um, those were some of the uh, some of the only photos um, from that scene. I think probably the, our first um, big successes were two uh, sort of polar opposites of journalism. One was um, Iran in 2009 as well. Um, we, uh, we developed a lot of relationships with people on the ground in Iran um, who we knew the identities of um, and we were in contact with through back channels, but we had to keep everything they were doing um, was publicly anonymized. And that's a big thing we do is we make sure that um, any, any of the data that's left on, uh, on things like image files um, is stripped out uh, before we pass it on to anyone else or before we post it on the web. So there's no way of tracking back through us to the people who have sent us information if they need, if they need to stay anonymous. And are you, are you paying these people? Are they, because yep. that, 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 the whole idea originally was that you know, this would be a way for people to get paid for their work. Um, yeah, um, and um, that's kind of dependent on what there is demand for. Um, we can only pay people um, if, uh, if the media here or in the UK or, or elsewhere where um, we sell, um, sell photos all over the world, if they buy the photos, cause, um, because otherwise we don't have any income. What we started doing recently, actually, um, is having advertising on the site. And the people whose stories get the most interest um, from, um, from people on the web, so from uh, browsers on the web. So the people whose stories are seen the most times uh, get a share of the advertising revenue on the site. Uh, we we pay out eighty percent of that. Um, and is this business model working? I mean, because there have been other attempts at doing this, of uh, you know, taking um, uh, user content and, and selling it, marketing it, and uh, a lot of them don't seem to have come to anything. Is it is it working for you? Um, yeah, we're doing very well. Uh, we're expanding. We're hiring more people. Um, we, uh, we grew by 250% in revenue last year, um, and, um, and we sold a huge number of photos and got a lot of stories out that otherwise wouldn't have been illustrated or perhaps even told. And is there, I mean, there's an interesting question of definition here, isn't there? I mean, do you think this, the barrier between you know, what we used to call citizen journalists and journalists is sort of melting away here? I mean, if, if these people are, you know, uh, <coughs> getting great material and selling it through you, they are, in, in effect, becoming professional journalists. Yes, they are. Um, but in many cases, um, people are contributing to Motics not because they want to sell photos, but just because they want to, they want to get, their get their stories story out there. Mm. And why, uh, why are they not getting their stories out? Why are they not calling the New York Times or um, the BBC? Why, 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 why would they go to Demotics? Because um, those organisations have their own uh, agendas, their own problems. They need to make money in the places where they're selling the news to people um, as a product. And let's not forget that, that in most cases the news is, is sold. Um, mm. Unfortunately, not everyone can work for the BBC. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the New York Times... <laughs> 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 Jobs for all of you. No The New York Times has to make money. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they publish things that Americans are interested in, and mm. unfortunately, at the moment, many Americans are not interested in what is happening in, in the Middle East, for example. Um, so there needs to be a place uh, somewhere uh, for those people to tell their stories, and we've set up somewhere that's uh, extremely specialised in photography. Um, for them to do but what's interesting about this is that you, you are a commercial business and you, you, what, what you're saying you have found a commercial model um, which you know the New York Times has not spotted the you know the other major news organizations haven't spotted well I suppose um, I suppose the the thing about the commercial model is we are um, we're filling in the space where news organizations can't afford um, to go anymore for example, CNN recently fired 50 photographers because they can't they can't afford to pay someone full-time wages, pay their health insurance, pay their pension, yeah, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and um, in a way, we've sort of replaced that with or complemented what they can 
afford to support for themselves with basically an army of freelancers all over the world um, who are doing this in many cases for the love of it, but in many cases um, because they're photographers and they would be doing it anyway. This is just another way for them to earn money from their photography. Um, uh, who are who are there, who are on the ground, and yeah, it costs them a lot less to, to get there and take the photo. Okay, so that's demotics. Um, Ryan Schlieff, you've been in this area for a longer than anybody here, I think. Uh, Ryan Schlieff's program manager at Witness, um, an international non-profit organization that uses video and storytelling to inform the world of human rights abuses. So you have been doing this long before the idea of citizen journalism or uh, apps or, or whatever became current. I'm probably the less techie person on the panel. This is good. This, this is, is good. good. I don't yeah. know if it's good, but yeah. um, uh, so in, in, in my job, I'm often working with the activists in different countries who uh, can help us understand the tools that they're using and how effective they are and what and where the gaps are, right? And so when we collect that information, then we can go to a project that we have, Witness Labs, and that's in partnership with the Guardian Project, and they can begin to construct the apps. So. Um, but let, let's yeah. spool back and, 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 and explain how Witness began. What, what, was, what was the original? Yeah, it's, it's our concept. 20th anniversary this year, right? And uh, we came out of Amnesty International, a, co a couple other human rights groups that at the time recognized that video and tech should be more a part of human rights campaigning work. And, you know, I don't have to say a lot has changed in 20 years. A lot, of cha as a lot has changed in two years. But at the time, the idea was you know, what if everyone had cameras and they could film human rights abuses and perhaps like catch the perpetrators in the act, or it could, you know, somehow insulate a community. Um, you were 20 years before your time. Yeah, I, I looked the same. <laughs> I looked the same, but... Uh, um, and what, the, the, what? Dr the dream hasn't been realized, mm. really, but there are more people with, you know, uh, tools that can act as cameras. So it's mobile phones, they can... You know, so in cameras. the early days, how were you getting the technology to people? I mean, and how were you getting literally parachuting in cameras, you know, and say, good luck, you know, work on your campaigns and let us know how it goes. And we realized soon that, you know, you need to not only train folks on how to use cameras, but how to use them and how to message the footage. And the most important part of our work, I think, is is structuring with the community how the distribution is going to work. So if it's the local village council person or the UN that's the ultimate decision maker on that human rights issue, how can we get those folks in the room with you, screen the video, explain your demands? It's, it's, it's not about exchange. broadcasting necessarily. It's not about reaching so, some, a global yeah, audience. I mean, sometimes our videos make it on TV or in film festivals, but I mean, we don't care. It's nice. Thank you, anyone who's seen our videos in film festivals. Mm -hmm. But the real purpose is to get the videos into places where um, the communities we work with often haven't been invited, you know, to participate in that process. So, give us an example. What what's been a successful um, project there? Well, in the past twenty, well, maybe I'll think more recently. Um, we're working um, in in Cairo quite a bit, and on one of our projects. Um, uh, we're working with a community in an informal settlement in a slum, and they uh, were demanding their housing and land rights. So they didn't actually have tenure to their land. So the first time they protested outside the governor's office, it was, you know, they're like, we're not sure exactly what to do. We'll bring some lunch. We'll all go there. We'll make up songs. It was amazing. And so while that was happening, they were filming it. And So who was filming it? Uh, the community that we had trained. So we usually train someone from the local community affected, and sometimes uh, a human right, a local human rights organization or NGO that's supporting them because we want to bring them together. So the video that 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 they had created before that, and the filming that they had done at that point, um, helped mobilize the community around a particular <coughs> message. They screened the video inside. You know as well, and uh, you know of course the governor said, "I'm not going to talk to you unless you put the cameras down." And they said, "These cameras are part of us. Like you have to talk with us with the cameras because they know once the camera goes off, the governor can say whatever he likes, and you know they don't have that documented." So uh, uh, 
they, one of the persons at the community was tweeting it, and I was following the tweet feed, and I was like, what is this? What's going on? Like, someone's tweeting. I was at a meeting of the UN on forced evictions at the time and showed everyone there, the leaders, like, this is what the community is, is doing. Here is, you know, their video. Let's hear what they have to say. Um, the next day, the governor shocked that people actually came to his office, number one. Number two, they came to his office demanding something, you know, from him and saying, these are our rights, and this is how we see that, that he, was, he gave them tenure to their land and promised not to forcibly evict them, right? So that's you know, a story of like just the community being able to control their message. It's, it's not likely that CNN is going to go and ask um, them questions about what's happening with them or their opinion on a range of topics. You know, so they need to take the, the, the media into their own hands. And you obviously see video as a very powerful tool, which it is in, in kind of broadcast terms, instead mm. of you know. Uh, but 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 you see it as almost more powerful when it's directly um, focused at mm. local people in power. Yeah, or, or it could be the United Nations. <coughs> but I think I think what's most important is that the. The production of putting together a video is actually pulling the community together around who are your spokespeople, what are the messages, how are you going to deliver this, and um, it helps create solidarity amongst them in order to like be very confident and approach the governor or whomever with this content. Like this is who we are, you know, and th they can decide how they're going to be viewed, who's going to be interviewed instead of having someone from the outside decide. So it's it's a very democratic tool, if I can use that word, you know, that allows people to participate. And, and over the 20 years you've been in, in business, obviously, as we've already said, the technology has transformed completely, whereby yeah. you, you, you don't have to, I presume, parachute cameras in anymore. There's an awful lot of more availability mm -hmm. of images. In, in a funny kind of way, does that make the, those images less powerful, because there's just so much video? Um, no, not individually. I, th I think that for some um, situations, like uh, for example, Syria, there's a lot of content coming out. But um, are you working in Syria? Are you? We, I mean, we've produced um, uh, materials and projects that has like spread throughout the Arab world. You know, so um, uh, in like specifically in Syria, with activists there, they are. Um, uploading a lot of content, but it may not necessarily be organized, or um, the context may not be there for someone to read it and, and understand what's happening in one scene or the other. In some situations, there's no content being uploaded at all, right? So, um, and, and it's not just about what content is online, it's what's being recorded and shared locally as well. So, in the places where we work, we try to understand what, the, what those streams of distribution and communication are. Um, I think mm. um, some of the video can be um, organized in a different way if it's online or offline, depending on um, you know, how impactful it's going to be to like moving the campaign beyond. But um, some of that content we just don't have control over. You know, it's just being uploaded quickly or being shared through, through streams that we're not connected to. OK, so we've. We've heard a whole range of um, different uses of, of, of this technology and um, uh, different experiences of it. Um, coming back to you, Christian, I mean, um, is, this, is this making a huge difference out there? Or have, have, have there, there was a huge excitement a year ago about the way these tools were being used. And then it seemed that actually, Governments were getting to grips with them and were, you know, uh, were, were fighting back. Where, where would you say we're on that? I think the technology is moving faster than um, people's awareness of how valuable and danger, dangerous it can be is catching up, if that makes sense. Um, it only took, you know, a regime, I think it was Syria, who to upload pictures of protesters on Facebook for people to have their friends tagging them. Mm. on that photograph and then these people vanishing as, as a result. So yeah, the technology is moving really fast. And uh, is it, it's important to remember is it it's, making in, a difference? it's in government's hands as well as... Yeah, exactly. So it, it's, it is important for people to, to, if they're in 
position to be able to share um, news information stories to wise up as fast as possible and, and more and more journalists are getting clued up as to what the possibilities are and if they can share and train that technology around them, fantastic. For, for me, <coughs> mobile devices are not going away anytime soon when it comes to, I mean, Al Jazeera today, I think, announced a film that's just been shot and it had iPhones splattered all over it. I'm sure it could have been shot on any phone. Mm. Um, that the filmmaker said couldn't have been done any other way because everybody has a mobile phone, therefore it's not an unusual thing to see somebody filming with a mobile phone. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, you, 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 I'm already hearing of examples of, you know, crews going into dangerous places, carrying, you know, and then putting away their, their usual kit, their broadcast kit, and shooting either on, well, digital SLRs, of course, are, yeah. for, for video are becoming more yeah, common. I, I have and, a hybrid camera phones. I took to Pakistan. I was told that there's a lot of, everything's a government building and I wasn't allowed to film anything. So I had a hybrid, um, it was called a Panasonic uh, GH1, and it would sit on my chest here, and when somebody said, no photos, I'd be like, no, 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 pan right. Panel, mm -hmm. uh, because it can film all the time effectively mm -hmm. if you've got a big enough card in there. Mm. Um, that people are finding more and more ways to get around this, but mobile apps, I think, are definitely mm. the way forward. Yes, it is making a difference. I just think that the amount of noise that's being created, the amount of noise that's being made, is it's necessary for people to, to get to grips with filtering this, filter it effectively, but it's also necessary for us to develop the technology for us to use these devices, and the iPhone is a nightmare for this. If I shoot a film on the iPhone, it's very difficult for me to get that film off if somebody turns the internet off. Mm. So we need more, and I'm gonna get a little bit geeky, uh, mesh networked capabilities so that my information on my phone can hop from phone to phone to phone to phone in this room and then out of this room across people's mobile phones until somebody walks past an open hotspot or something and gets that information so out. So how should we build a mesh network capability? <laughs> you're you're okay. the guy for this. Yeah, sure. Uh, you can start with all the free wireless networks that are in London um, and you can redistribute those wireless networks uh, by <laughs> customising a Linksys uh, router, for example. You can connect in client mode using an open source firmware. Um, I don't think you meant exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm writing it down. <laughs> um, so there is an issue of um, the protocols that have actually been currently developed and deployed in, in handsets that are available commercially. They've done it in Austria, in Graz. Um, they have an internet that sits on top of the internet. They're 15 miles away from the border in the Czech Republic now. So if Austria turns off the internet, they have their own. And, so and that's with the routers like you've just explained. Um, we can do the you know, you know, long range Wi-Fi shooting over a border to uh, a friendly uh, group, or I think even examples of physicists and people in university communities using their microwave links between, between campuses to try and actually get the connectivity back to a country which has been disconnected. The, the, the key, th therefore, is how do you then go the last mile to get the data to the crowd? I believe the solution might be um, sort of uh, interplay between, between uh, phones, say an Android phone, but in this case it would be a small ad hoc wireless network that was set up. Maybe the, the mesh standard, as it's understood, it doesn't really exist in a way that is is, is usable with, with common devices. There, there are a lot of drawbacks to the, the size, the scale of the network, how reliable it is. Um, there are so many different handsets out there. Practically speaking, we could see a router in a in a in a, in a backpack with 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 uh, running on a battery, which would you know serve you know maybe 200 people nearby, um, and that would be feasible. Right. You could tell that. The, the MiFi is a good example of a device. Um, I believe the processing capabilities, the, the, the processor in this wouldn't be powerful enough to, to run, you said five, and yeah. so that would be the amount that you might be able to run off that. And you could potentially see though something which is concealable inside a rucksack being used um, to empower a larger group of people and having some local storage element, even a netbook or something running as a server, then you could have your local Twitter thing, you could have your uh, mesh networking. And then there have been great examples from groups from, I think, uh, one of the occupations in, in America where they've been actually grant funded to be able to try and create um, this kind of internet in a suitcase idea. A lot of these kinds of solutions involve you storing some of the updates, the tweets, the messages and things, kind of keeping them in stasis until you get connectivity back. So your app works the same way as you'd intend it to. Um, it's completely transparent to you, but then the communication happens uh, asynchronously.
um, through through this this server, you know, in, in a backpack, essentially trying to repeatedly send. And the is updates. any of this innovation happening in um, uh, the Middle East, in, in 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 countries where you know? It, it may be actually needed more. We're talking about this kind of context where you know people have set up whole mobile phone networks to empower communities where people are being tortured, killed, maimed. Mm. Um, I actually have a lot of respect uh, for people that are prepared to put themselves on the line to actually go out to really challenging environments and actually try and create some modicum of infrastructure out there for people that really need it. Because um, this is the same for war correspondents, same as I know there are some um, techies and engineers that will go out to these kind of uh, places and, and provide There's them. There's an organisation called Telecom Sans Frontières, which... Medicine you know, Sans Frontières is an uh, object in tech. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, think, I think this is vital, and I think you know, any device or innovation which could be put into the hands of people that are actually prepared to go out there and try and maintain this infrastructure is, is, a, is a positive benefit to empowering uh, people uh, who are just trying to um, go about their daily lives or you know, actually maintain their civil liberties. Um, I was going to jump in. Yeah. Something. I, th I think that, you know, as as we're developing these really amazing, cool apps <coughs> for here are my props for phones like this. This is my Android waterproof. I can throw it across the room, and it'll probably survive. This is the phone I use, and this is the phone that many people that I work with use as well. Um, so t tell people what it is. Um, this one. <laughs> it's a Nokia. It's not a Nokia yeah. 3330. Yeah. I mean. I would have a camera on it too. It's anything you know, but so a smartphone. In other anything words. but a smartphone. But um, and a lot of the folks that we we work with, they may have um, you know a used beat up BlackBerry. That's their camera, right? That's their camera. And then this is their phone. You know, <laughs> so it's not that they're going to have the BlackBerry and be in Tahrir Square and like uploading automatically the content somewhere. I mean, they would possibly take the the BlackBerry somewhere else review the footage, look at it, perhaps edit it or understand it, and then in a secure place decide what's going to be uploaded to where. So I, I think that we need to have a couple different streams of development work that, you know, the really cool toys that um, are great for uploading video content like immediately can be really great for not uploading video content and just capturing video in a very simple, user-friendly way um, and saving it somewhere else and screening it locally or maybe never putting it on the internet ever because we have to recognize that it's still not the place for everyone to find their content, right? So it's, it's about, I forget the word that you said when we were having a beer, but it was a good word. Cheers. Cheers, <laughs> yeah. <besides laughs> that but it was about, I'll just say something not as smart, but it's like repurposing the, the, the amazing tools that are coming out yeah. for different purposes. And I, it's not about hi-fi, lo-fi. It's about, wow, this is a really great tool that's going to help someone out with the specific purpose that they have in mind. There right? are lots of paths to the internet. Yeah. And an example in Egypt was um, when uh, Al Jazeera's office was, was shut down, they sent guys out with audio boo on mobile devices. And then when the internet was switched off, audio boo sent a telephone telephone number out so that people could use your Nokia phone here to effectively podcast from by phoning a free number. Do people know what Audio Boo is, by the way? Explain what Audio, Audio Boo is. Audio Boo is a, uh, a simple podcasting app um, for multiple devices. You, you literally just record, upload, you can add a geotag if you want, you can it's, add a it's photograph. It's YouTube for radio in a way. It is. It's, I guess it's Audio YouTube in a way, yeah. yeah. Um, but the fact that you could just have a phone number on, on a normal phone and it will say you'll, you'll, you will be recording in five seconds, then you go, you record your piece that you want to say, click stop and it's on the internet and it goes into the Audio Boo's kind of main Twitter account so you already have an audience. And it, using whatever technology is available, one of the many routes to get the audience, and like you say, n not always that audience is, mm -hmm. it might be the people that make the decisions that need to see it more than someone sat at home going, this is terrible, who can't do anything. Mm. I think it's really important to have those kind of lo-fi solutions because the, the companies that make um, the kind of phones that we have here are under all kinds of different pressures um, that aren't necessarily compatible with using technology for protest or for journalism. For example, um, Apple has a patent on a system to stop all the iPhones in an area from being able to take photos, which was probably designed for, for concerts or for the cinema or for mm. something like that, mm. where they're saying, well, people are infringing our copyright with their iPhones, <coughs> and we need to be able to stop them. But 
that's that's a uh, stop the protest in a box for <coughs> yeah for the Syrian regime. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, exactly. Let's let's throw this open. Uh, let's get interactive. Um, can we have comments, questions, um, provocations from the floor? Who wants to start? <laughs> Be brave. We've got somebody. Uh, I think we've got a roving mic. I might take three comments or questions and then chuck them at the panel. Hi, this is one mainly to Tom, but maybe also to Christian as a practicing photographer. You said that you can protect your sources so that nobody can track from the images who they are, where they were, and the flip side of that is that people can abuse those images and you know, the people who are, how can I say, sort of um, putting their lives to a degree on the line and committing a lot of time and effort to that need to make <coughs> a living as well. So how do you square that circle, you know, protecting people's image rights while at the same time protecting their identity? Okay, uh, let, let me, there's, there's another one here. Um, hi, Juliana Rufus from Al Jazeera. Um, my question is really about old media and new media because this is very much billed as a I new love media that discussion. I love that yeah, question. and I know there's so much debate mm. about this. But um, <laughs> if, if I understand um, what Sam is doing right, and you described yourself as a geek, but um, if, if I understand it right, what you're doing is actually quite editorial in that you are filtering and, 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 and you're looking at what, what's true and representative and what isn't. Um, and also, Tom, what you're doing strikes me as quite editorial as well. So are we getting to a point where old media, where, where new media is becoming old media in that it's no longer sort of solely citizen journalism, which I think is a questionable kind of phrase anyway because is citizen journalism journalism but is citizen journalism now becoming old media in that there are people around who are editing and um, looking at the distribution of content and you know applying traditional criteria okay and let's get one more <laughs> from the guy in the pink shirt to compliment your pink socks, Rory, I think. <laughs> Sorry, there's a, there's a trend going up there oh just, to, uh, <laughs> just to provide the context. He, he does it on purpose. <laughs> you need to add a, a screen back there, so I think you guys can see the Twitter trends too. It's just not fair having them behind you. Um, just to compliment the kind of old media, new media, I, I sort of posit that the thing that unifies you guys, which is pretty disparate, is that you're all agents of change. Journalists, techies, protesters. I think that's the kind of unifying thread. Um, what I put out there is that is there a sort of similar thing between old media and new media as old protest and new protest? So I think about Lulsec and uh, Anonymous. Is, is that a form of new protest that perhaps didn't exist um, five years ago? Um, is, does that count as protest? And how does kind of old protest fit within new protest? And where is protest going to be in, in five years' time? If this oh is the kind God, of is difference that's going on. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, if, yeah. if you could do that in the next sort of 30 that seconds, that would be yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's start with the question about, um, as far as I understand it, um, uh, rewarding people who are, you know, risking their lives uh, professionally versus, you know, protecting their identities. Um, okay, so as I understand it, uh, understood it, your question had two parts basically. So, are we compensating people adequately for the risks that they're taking? Um, and are we protecting them from from backtracking to the source of the information? I'm not necessarily questioning you in that sense, but when people take the pictures, use the pictures from your website, how mm. then do you make sure that they do not abuse the because all the metadata is tricked, I guess? Yeah, exactly. So basically, what we are is um, is a technological and kind of a, a legal buffer between um, anyone who sees or uses the photos. Um, and the photographer. So the photographer um, grants us the license to distribute the photos and sell them on their behalf, et cetera, et cetera. So anything to do with people buying the photos, um, people wanting to get more and wanting to get in touch with the photographer, all of that stuff is done through us. Um, so there's no direct interaction um, there. So there's no way to kind of trace them back um, in that way. And the same goes for technology. Um, we uh, we strip out anything that could be used to identify people um, before before passing on any anything. Um, well, you've got you've got a take on this, presumably. As a, do you still 
it's call an yourself it's a really, photographer? Yeah, and I, mean, I don't as much. But for me, yeah. it's kind of interesting because in many ways, the message from that image is way more important than, than the 50 quid or whatever a main image in a newspaper is, is going to get me. I changed my well, business you don't, you don't, a long you don't time need ago. To, you don't need to earn a living from, from um, photography. No, I, mean, but but I, I imagine that the, the, the protester on the photog- street isn't thinking, woohoo, this is going to earn no. me a fortune. It's about getting the message out primarily. So they're very easily ripped off. There are so many tools out now that, I mean, I changed my business model from selling photographs to once in a while sitting down and invoicing people for theft, normally newspapers. <laughs> mm. And there's tools out there like tinai.com which will enable, um, if I, I've got lots of images of musicians, Amy Winehouse, Damien Rice and all the rest of it that have been online long enough now to be indexed by Google. So I right click any of those mm-hmm. images and then they get searched for on the internet <coughs> and it says who's using them. If it's, a, if it's a fan, if it's a blog, fine, no problem at all, they've credited me. If it's a newspaper, I'll invoice them. If it's a Daily Mail, I'll invoice them five times as much. That's and when they complain, <laughs> I say, I'm not invoicing you for use. It doesn't matter how big you used it. I'm invoicing you for theft. And because I'm still a member of the National Union of Journalists, I have some legal assistance in and how's extracting that, how's the that cash. Working? How's that working? 1,400 quid a weekend. You can sit there if you've got enough images on Flickr, open and ready for people to share. It's mm. very important we share our content. Obviously, I don't do that every weekend. Mm. Uh, I won't be sat here. No. <laughs> We're not getting paid. <laughs> But um, no, it's, that's an interest. You, you were going to add. To yeah, that. No, I was going to add. Um, I was going to talk about our secure smart cam project. So it's not. Uh, it's a tool. It's not an ans- a full answer to your your question. But it's a suite of mobile phone apps that do a few different things. Like one of them allows for um, the user to to blur out um, or mask the identity of, of whomever they're they're taking in a particular image. Um, and stripping the, the metadata um, from that. Another um, allows the user to allow in a lot of metadata in an encrypted way, so GPS and, and other um, uh, like compass direction to uh, provide more verifiable evidence you know, that can be encrypted and shared. Presuming that's the constant source. dilemma between protecting the sources and, and <coughs> having them believable yeah. and authenticated. And, and, you know, for us as a human rights organization, safety and security is number one. That's the, like, paramount use. And then um, with each of the apps, there's a, a possibility of, of recording or, or, or um, keeping uh, informed consent um, from that user and also understanding the, you know, the, the person who's using it, that they understand what informed consent is. How is this image going to be used? It's going on the internet. What does that mean for you? What if the perpetrator finds you? And if that is something that the person is agreeing with, that can be recorded as uh, data with that image. Do you think that's, lo- that, that's been ab- abused, that, that, that lack of savviness amongst uh, people about their, their their material by mainstream media organisations. Well, I, uh, you, you see, you, yeah. you see a ton of stuff on the news every night now from from Syria with, <coughs> you know, with people's faces on. Mm. On, a, on I, I, at least there should be an option for people to decide how their images are going to be used, and and for the person who's the user to also have that conversation, that discussion, because as we've seen. Um, in several situations, Green Revolution Iran. But how do you how do you make that work? I mean, if 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 you're a mainstream or media organisation and you see that uh, fabulous material has appeared on YouTube from a um, uh, from activists, say in Syria, mm. um, what what would you say the moral duties of that media organisation are? That in practical terms, it's going to be quite difficult to. Um, Contact the people behind that material and say. So if the, the image is blurred, so I mean, in I, with. You think blurring should be, kind of. St- it would be interesting if YouTube allowed anonymization as mm. well. You know that there is an option. There's a commercial benefit as well if you think about it a little mm. bit. That that may be an interest, um, but uh, the there could be enough data supporting that and the, the user, him or herself, could also be a trusted source as well. That, I mean, we have to think about the, 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 the individuals who are being featured in the video and what's going to happen to them after CNN broadcasts mm-hmm. it to X number of people. You know, like, that's the important story, I think. You know, mm-hmm. and that whether or not you can, you know, identify, whether or not the government can identify that person should be 
the number one thing that people think about, you know, not just uh, um, getting the image up there. And, and it's also about individual stories, like how are they describing the events? You know, that can really send the message, not just, you know, the, the interview of the person speaking. Uh, now, we had the question about whether the, the boundaries are being blurred between new media uh, and old media and whether, you know, I mean, we've got, um, uh, have we got any one person on this, on the panel, apart from myself, who considers, would consider themselves primarily a journalist? I mean, do you no, still? No, no, definitely a blogger. Right, right. I can't oh, spell. So I can't so spell at all. What's the difference between a journalist and a blogger? Um, I can partake in journalism. I can, I can take part in journalistic activities. Journalism is an act. There's no blogger or journalist argument here. Anybody can do journalism, providing they adhere to certain codes, as such, um, mostly moral ones. Uh, but for me, calling myself a blogger means. I get away with more in my experimentation. I have a lot more fun when I'm <laughs> not doing serious work. So and I can tweet from blog, the toilet. Blog, blogging is more fun, on. right. Yeah, well, for me, yeah, because for, uh, the, the, I, I, I'm playing. That's one reason why I have these mm. devices and not, mm. um, you know, Ubuntu on a, on a, I am getting some Ubuntu soon. But for me, I, I have to see this as, as play, I, to, to get the most out of all of these apps, use them all day, every day, and not think of this as serious work. But if I am on a serious assignment, I guess then I become a little bit more journalistic. But I'm definitely not a writer. I use audio, uh, photos, video primarily. So are you a journalist? Um, no, so not, I'm, a <coughs> I'm actually an electronic engineer. I um, came at this from a completely, <laughs> no, a completely different angle. Um, <laughs> My name is Sam, I'm an electronic engineer. <laughs> First, yeah, um, yeah, I'm guilty of that. Um, I, I wanted to touch on the very important uh, point about uh, editorial bias, um, which may be derived from what your yeah. comment was. Bias is your word. I know, <laughs> yes, well aware. Um, we're, sens <laughs> we're sensitive mm. to this because crowdsourcing in the truest sense means taking you know neutrally from the crowd giving back to the crowd we're, we're trying to improve the signal to noise ratio of 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 the messages and, and nothing else and 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 it's so difficult to do that when you have uh, you know human bias or your, your editorial bias as an individual um and you're trying to disseminate between what's noise what's good in quality information so this is why it's so important that we're using techniques like natural language processing we're using uh, you know keyword searching techniques and large databases of words to try and work out uh, how to group and clump together tweets, which is some, you know, I think Twitter is also taking similar uh, steps, Swift River similarly, um, and we, we have a natural language processing guru person uh, who's a, a good friend who's helping us develop some techniques. And what we can get to is we can have this concept of an event, um, then we can use the fact that that event actually did happen as verified by someone who's actually on the ground <laughs> to then actually have this feedback effect which gives the, the, the so you don't, people you updating don't, you messages a better standing the next time around. So the only feedback loop we could create. Uh, and, and it seems more objective than just sort of saying we do or don't like what that person's saying in relation to what's going on. Um, so we're, we're really trying not to, to, to we're trying to shed that um, uh, connotation or that, that failing of old media if that was possible to interpret. From so how does that sound to you? So, um, firstly, old media and journalism are now synonymous, and kind of that sits a little bit funny. But also what's interesting is, is how negative um, journalism I is being seen. I mean, yeah. you're saying anybody can be a journalist. Yeah. I would say not anybody can be a journalist. People get taught to be journalists because mm -hmm. they're criteria, there are things like journalists try to be objective. And, so, so you know, and you're, you're saying, saying not and everybody just finish, can be you get your say in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, 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 <laughs> And you're saying being a blogger is a lot more fun. I'm a journalist. I have a hell of a lot of fun. Let me assure you. <laughs> I really love my job, yeah? So I find it fun to be a journalist. And I don't think anybody can be a journalist. And that's the whole notion of citizen journalism, which I'm not really buying into, because I think it's really important to get citizen voices and, and, and to hear all of that. But to me, a voice and journalism are different things, ultimately. I, I really appreciate what you're doing that kind of because I think what you're doing sounds very very democratic in that you're looking at you, you know the volume of information being turned out and 
you know, I need to look at that more and understand it more. Um, but I, what, what frightens me a little bit about this debate is that journalism is, is being seen as an unfashionable thing, as a, as a kind of non-hip thing f for reasons that I don't quite get. And, and, and I, I think there is still, you know, what is editorial? What an editor does is decide what's in and what's out. And I think the reasons of that can be many. I mean, you said it is like and dislike. I don't necessarily yeah. think that's always the case because traditional journalism would say um, you show both points of view. Um, I think people edit things and stories for different reasons. I think you've got a really valid and good platform for editing what you're doing. And for, for me, the main thing is that you have to be transparent about yeah. how and why you edit something in a certain way. And that work is what you've just done very well. And, and the problem is when the editing isn't transparent. I mean, and the criteria. Well, <coughs> you must have a take on this. I mean, um, uh, yeah, well, uh, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you a journalist? Are you? I'm a journalist by training. And whether that makes someone a journalist is itself probably a probably a debate um, too tedious to go into here. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I actually think that. Um, that so, but you're, you're you're making a judgment. I mean, who, who decides what goes on the site at Demotics? Um, basically, the publishers. They decide: can we believe this? Is it a good enough photo? Is it of a news story? And they're not doing of, classic journalism. Not of someone's dog. Yeah. They are filtering yeah. the stuff that comes in and saying this is news. This is not news. Yeah, which is you know what news editors have said done since the year dot. Exactly. And, and you ask them, they say, my mum ain't interested <coughs> in it, this or whatever. Yeah, and that's something I think that is starting to filter through into what we what we are still calling new media for some reason, um, is that actually um, you know some of the the things like codes of ethics that we have developed over hundreds now years of, of journalism of newspapers and TV journalism are actually there for a reason and they're valuable. Um, like just to take a random example from technology, um, you can't have a technology blog only writing about companies that it's. Chief editor invests He's money in, it, yeah. um, because that's Could you be unethical. talking about TechCrunch managers? I'm yeah, not yeah, going to name yeah, any names because yeah, they're yeah, being sued. You probably have a legal team. So I think that for me, um, I do think that just about anyone can be a journalist, um, I'm afraid. I think the old quote is um, a convincing manner, a little literability, and a rat-like rat -like cunning. cunning. Um, <laughs> And you know, you get the classic um, counter argument is, well, you wouldn't go to a citizen brain surgeon, would you? And <laughs> journalism isn't brain surgery. It's knowing what questions to ask and knowing who to talk to and developing relationships. And that's something a lot of people can do. And a lot of people are finding out that they can do usefully without even necessarily being paid for it. And that might be scary, but it's also a fact that we just have to accept. And I think it's mostly semantics here. I said anybody can do journalism. I don't think that gives them a right to call themselves a journalist. And personally, I think now is the single most important time for journalists to get involved in these channels. Because if it's not for the trained journalists who totally know how to look at, sit on the fence and look at it from both angles to assess, review, retweet, curate the curation tools out there, although balancing on a knife edge or of how long are these platforms going to last before our stories fall apart. But the curation tools out there are vital for trained journalists to sit there. And we've been doing stuff with Goldsmiths, there's a few students in the audience here, where they're pulling stuff in from everywhere. And they're checking out this person's Twitter account. Where were they? Did they geotag the data? What kind of, look at their past history. Have they got a link to their blog? All of this that a normal blogger might not do, but a blogger practicing journalism or being journalistic for a moment will do that. And, and I think this is, this is vital. And let's face it, journalists, trained journalists, are taking a very long time catching up with these devices. So if they can't get their stories out there quicker than the man on the street who has the device or woman on the street with their phone in their pocket, then they should be sitting to receive <coughs> it going, OK, let's do something long form around this. Let's, let's, let's add some credibility to what at the moment is a massive of threads flapping around in the, the ether net. <laughs> We've got a uh, gentleman here. Yeah, I just want to support the idea of uh, citizen journalism. Um, I wouldn't call myself a journalist, but many years ago I 
uh, was able to get all the files from the uh, Economic League and pass them on to the Observer. I'm not a journalist, by the way. Right. And I was also able to <coughs> interview one of the Birmingham Six and pass on information as to who actually did the Guildford Four uh, uh, bo uh, bombing, and it wasn't the Guildford Four, and I passed that on to Gareth Pierce. Um, recently, why, I... Why do you not call yourself a journalist, then? Uh, because I'm not paid journalist. I, I, I'm just interested in, in, in getting in, interesting information. Now, recently, I, a few months ago, I started a campaign on Twitter to get Bradley Manning nominated as a, as a Nobel Peace Prize nominee. And it was taken up by Brigitte uh, Johns, um, I've forgotten the last name, at uh, an Icelandic MP, and she got the Icelandic parliament to nominate him, and he was nominated. This is how the world exists now. Forget all the usual journalism. Uh, WikiLeaks has, 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 has changed everything. We're all WikiLeaks now, and we all need the, the security. And, and interestingly, I have made sure that, for example, on my computer, I have got Hotspot Shield, Prox XPN, uh, and Tor uh, Bundle, and Anonymous NIMS. I think we should all have them, seriously. We're all journalists, and we all need security, and we're all able to expose what's going on in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And, and somebody over there wanted to make a point? I think um, it's a very interesting debate, and what's the good thing about technology and these apps is that it gives you instant access to where you are in any conflict uh, driven situation. Um, just a thought and uh, perhaps a question as well. Are we reaching an age of journalism where we could editorially say that high impact quality material, high impact material could take over high quality material? Would you take an editorially based decision on on the base of the impact of the material or the quality of the material? Well, yes, yeah, so that's, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I've got into discussions with students about, uh, about this. I mean, what, what one of the interesting things is that um, editors, I think, are losing confidence. When I started in journalism, editors had amazing, ridiculous confidence in their own news judgment. They knew what was a story and what was not. Now you can go to them and say, actually, the most read story on the BBC News is Man Mary's Goat. We should be doing that. Um, <laughs> is, is, is the... Is that a danger that you know high impact is taking over from high quality? I mean, this, this is the other side. Of the, the, yes, the, one, the wonderful I, side of this technology is its measurability. You can get yeah. instant feedback on, you know, how but many hits. Who it gets really on. pays attention to what's trending on Twitter? I mean, really. I mean, there is no chance that the most important human rights story will ever get a look in if a celebrity dies. Well, just a minute, just a minute. Um, nobody's brought up one of the more interesting technology stories of the last ten days. Um, Not one that you did. No, no. Okay. Stop, Coney. Okay. Uh, um, I, I just, I was, I was just waiting for somebody uh, to kill that. To, to, no, to, I, mean, I, I completely that. missed that. My filtering is obviously much better than yours. <laughs> mm. But for me, um, it's about creating the networks and creating the lists um, around what is relevant. A social network is about connecting with people who share a common interest as such, and that's how the information is spread in my networks effectively and quickly it's you know if you know if i look at someone's profile and, and no disrespect to anybody that really loves football i'm not a massive football fan but i tend to put them in a list rather than follow them because i don't necessarily need that massive amount of information distraction uh, in my timeline so filtering is vital here as much as anything else and that's, you making, a, that's you making a you know a personal journalistic judgment of what's important I guess. and what's not. I didn't not. even know but I was doing that. But yeah, you said earlier yeah. on, not every video has to be viral. If the information, and very very retweet that if you find it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I teach video for the web courses, and, and when I say to people what's quality, they're like, oh, it has to be crisp, it has to be clear, it has to be eloquent. And then I show them a cat playing the piano with 158 million views, mm, and mm, it was like, mm. right, yeah. okay, so we want to get our stuff seen by more than anybody else. Is the secret to have a cat in every frame? What yes. song the cat plays? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's actually <laughs> important. I, I, want, I wanted to comment on what you were saying about impact, because the uh, the type of content that draws the impact, of course, differs for countries. You know, different countries, and so an image of someone who has been murdered and it's quite graphic may be on the front page of a newspaper in one country and never be featured in another. Right. So um, 
it can be very difficult you know, when you're constantly dealing with graphic images, whether you're in the audience or you're taking the footage or a part of the, the community that's being, that's being featured. Sometimes what gets lost are the personal stories. Like you don't actually know what the situation is anymore. And if you see graphic content, you're like, OK, in three months' time, am I going to remember the story or am I going to remember that image? And our brains will remember the image and not the story. So when, where we work, where there's a, a, there's a lot of graphic content, and that's what creates the impact. That's what creates the shock, right? It's about m remembering to like include the story of what's happening. Because if you watch a video from you know here in this country of another country, you may not understand the context. You just know that someone has been injured or beaten, but not what has happened, what has led to that. So I'm you know pushing also for the the, the stories that create impact. Kony is an interesting example, and I could talk for. It. Give us 30 seconds. Whew. OK, two things. Ready? Two things. Um, separating everything else, whether I like it, I don't like it, these are two things. So um, a colleague of mine, I wish he was here, said something amazing. He said, you know, the demographics of this video is like 15 to 25. A lot of young people around the world have gotten excited about participating in something. OK? It came in at a certain level of their understanding, whatever. There are judgments about that. but. Now other people are saying, don't participate, it's wrong. And my fear is that they're not going to participate the next time, or they're just going to be turned off to campaigning, right? That, that we just need to be careful about how we're messaging th this criticism about a video campaign that was directed to young people as well to participate, OK? Number two, I <coughs> am amazed that as a campaigner, that there's a 2012, 20 celebrities, including Rihanna, Kanye West, Ellen DeGeneres, and 12 political people, right? The very exciting Harry Reid and other people from the US. 20 celebrities, 12 policymakers. Contact them. Who are you going to retweet? Are you going to direct message Rihanna or Harry Reid and Condoleezza Rice? It's interesting that, that that's part of the campaign. When we think about media streams, it's like, what's the value of three minutes on CNN? And what's the value of, three, of Rihanna retweeting something to her <coughs> millions of followers? Where are you going to put your attention? Getting your three minutes on CNN? Maybe not. Maybe it's just, hey, Rihanna, mm. retweet this. And, mm. you know, it's, and you can have twit pics and links to videos. You've got your story Sam. linked there. It's like I think Sam had a point. We yeah. had some quite fascinating comments on, uh, we had, OK, just all the themes. WikiLeaks, Iceland, uh, Anonymous, um, <laughs> journalism. OK, let's take this just as a, as a slice through what was said. <laughs> Iceland presents a very unique opportunity for anyone trying to ensure the integrity of the data and uh, the fact that when your server gets subpoenaed, someone tries to take that data away from you, you can be fairly rest sure that the, the company are going to turn around and say, no, thank you very much. Um, that's our customers' data. We're going to be looking after that. Um, you need to consider that the integrity of the company that you submit your data to is probably the weak link in this day and age when you're looking at um, cases of you know, civil liberties infringement, whistleblowing, and, and, and if you are serious about wanting to ensure your privacy personally in uh, getting your data uh, you know, to and from web services that you want to use, you, you may well consider running a VPN through uh, the 1984 cluster in Iceland, for example. Um, and um, this would be very useful to you uh, as a tool. Um, and you should also ask where your services are hosted and actually demand that actually you know, yours this time is, is Iceland too. Um, uh, the perhaps understated role that Anonymous can play in, in this ecosystem of journalism web whistleblowing and, and, and what's going on in, in new media, um, some people will be going to get information. Some people will just be trading stories. Um, some people will be actually getting leaked information that exists in, in very tech, you know, backwater, dark web parts of the internet where you don't browse, you don't attend and actually bring them to the fore and actually then leaking them and working with journalists and people in traditional media to make sure those important stories get out. So people are often making a very personal sacrifice, especially in the case of Assange. His personal life is probably um, not fantastic under house arrest, and we need to consider the role that WikiLeaks is going to have to play in shedding the light on uh, democracies uh, such as the US, where they're genuinely trying to infringe civil liberties of people within their, corp their, their country and without extolling the virtues of, of adopting democracy and, and pushing uh, their views in, in other countries. So we need to actually sort of see the, the role uh, of, of progressive uh, democracies in countries like Iceland in, in setting a kind of a paradigm or a, a, an archetype to be followed uh, by other countries is, is just that. 
that when you do take um, a firm stance on, on you know, data integrity, security, and privacy first, and um, you don't compromise on that, you can see the best and most innovative apps and things coming to your country. Um, and, and just from a, a kind of growth point of view, even if you want to look at it economically, it would be a good idea to, to adopt a policy like that. For you guys, your consumer preference should be <coughs> probably Iceland first. Um, in that in that case, um, how, how do you feel? Sorry for stepping. Big in. advert for Iceland. Um, Next wave of journalism. That was a really interesting point. I'd love to get Sam's take on that. Next wave of protest. Sorry. Um, I think it could it could well be considered that um, Occupy is, is having quite a large effect uh, on on the global political discussion, the things that are going on, social economic justice, um, and we're seeing the nature of protest evolving. Um, a to B marches appear to be relatively ineffective. They, they in, in my personal opinion, they're a measure of solidarity. As a group, we've got an identity. We are marching somewhere to, to show strength, to show one purpose, but it doesn't necessarily have the effect uh, intended when your group is kettled or contained. Truly in terms of like surface to volume ratio, what would happen if you distributed and decentralized that protest and had lots of small groups and small actions are going, up, going around in a city, would that actually be more effective? Would that be harder to stop? Um, and is that not, in fact, what's happening with guerrilla tactics and things in, uh, in other countries where uh, freedom fighters or people are trying to, um, you, you're not seeing ar armies forming up in, in large, in, in battalions and things and actually meaning head on in the field. This is just not the nature of uh, uh, a war anymore. It's certainly not the nature of, of, of protests and people that are trying to, um, put forwards a message, it will be scrappy, it will be, you know, small groups of people making actions and statements. Um, Can I throw in a book recommendation at this point? Um, New Model Army by Adam Roberts, which talks very much about what you're talking about now. Okay, we are moving towards a close. Let's have a couple more points from one there and one there. Um, so just to, to move away from journalism and towards uh, the hardware, um, I was a bit curious about how easy it might be to triangulate the position of a Wi-Fi server. Um, and also maybe if you want to look at sort of different technologies like uh, uh, open space sort of uh, optics um, to transmit data over, over lasers or sort of mazes or IR lasers or something like that, um, and whether you think that's feasible. I'm going to quickly take, let's deal with that one, and um, then... Yeah, uh, the mathematics saying iterative multilateration. Um, basically, if you have lots of receivers, you can relatively work out by time difference of arrival, et cetera, um, where the thing is. Military tech in the UK is very sophisticated and can find a radio within milliseconds, unfortunately. Let's hope the Metropolitan Police Service don't have this stuff deployed uh, in general. I'm sorry if I've just given them a tip. Um, <laughs> but essentially, what we're working towards is... Um, yeah, um, the, 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 the kind of directional line of sight laser thing is interesting. And th there was even something recently using light from the room to actually transmit Wi-Fi and actually in using uh, sensors on, on the camera to interpret um, the Signal. amplitude change or, or the, the frequency change in, um, in, in the light level to, to transmit data. And these are viable, but there, there's obviously problems with, with implementation in, in the practical terms. Um, Apple would not I, allow that. Uh, certainly not on a, on a stock and, uh, Apple device. Okay, over there. Uh, well, after a career in law enforcement, uh, I thought I might add a dissenting <laughs> note. Um, <laughs> most of what you're talking about is actually is storytelling. Mm. Uh, and you're adding in technology and also the principle of trust and verify and the role of journalism. But what I would say, in actual fact, and I'm only talking about the context in the Western liberal democracies, not Syria is the biggest threat to what you're talking about it comes from the inadvertent development of technology, like you said about trying to stop people using uh, f cameras in cinemas, but also from the power of private corporations. If a particular private corporation decides, I'm not going to have my story on the web, then that corporation will succeed because they have the power to do it, and they will pay you, all four of you, to do it, regardless of your morals on occasion, or people outside this room who will do it. Uh, I think the other nasty part about it, and it's partly directed at the guy uh, from Witness, uh, in respect of the Coney thing, a lot of what you're talking about is not protest, it is sheer froth. Because 32 million people who have watched the YouTube probably haven't done anything. But if Harry Reid did something, that would make a difference. 
that was your point. Would you like to respond? So you said that, that the millions of people who watch the video do not have the same power as one Harry Reid. That's what you're saying. Or mm -hmm. just because they watch the video, they haven't done it. I, I don't, I'm assuming that the 32 million people have done quite a lot. And, and why, why should 32 million people looking at a video worry me? Is it going to have an impact? And the answer is, and the answer is there seems to be very little sign of an That's impact. That's a bit of a, a council of take despair about whatever, what, what, any journalistic activity, any any coverage of, you know, you, you might as well say it's not worth um, getting those videos out of Syria. No, I, I'm not talking about Syria. I deliberately mm. decided not going to the Syria mode. I have apologies for going to Uganda or the Central African mm. Republic. But, for example, I could t give you an illustration. If you talk about Occupy, I know one city where there were 12 people involved in Occupy. I don't need to worry as a police officer about 12 people. Um, why should you be worried as a police officer by Occupy? <laughs> would be my first question. <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, if you may ask me to make a professional judgment about a protest and there are only 12 people there, mm. I'm not interested. Mm. It doesn't cause me a problem. What if they were maybe all maybe anonymous and they all had laptops? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, st <laughs> still yeah. just connected but to it's only 2 people. million people. <laughs> it's only 12 people. <laughs> OK. <laughs> And he takes one domino. Um, have we got one more? I, I think, right, we, we've got one more, one more point, and then we are going to have to wrap up because we're running over time. I just wanted to comment on the last commenter. Um, I appreciate what you're saying, but I think what we're seeing here is the creation of political opportunity structures, not actions in themselves. All the Coney video was about, ostensibly, was making Joseph Coney famous. He is famous. That happened. But we're talking about it. Yeah, yeah we're yeah. talking about it. Um, the next step is something different. And the Harry Reid question is about political opportunities and creating structures for political entre for entrepreneurs and normal entrepreneurs to act within. And that's what this kind of mass, you know, clicktivism, slacktivism, whatever you want to call it, is essentially about. Um, as opposed to bodies on the ground, which is what I think you're saying. Anyway, I haven't actually got a question, but if anyone wanted to comment on that, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I think that's a very good point. I think, um, I think we have reached an end. I think we've, we've roamed far and wide. We've, we've uh, gone deep, deep into the technology, deeper than, 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 than some of us have ever swum before. And we've also gone into the sort of ethical and journalistic practice questions. So um, I, I've certainly learned a lot tonight. And thank you very much to the panel. And thank you for being such a, a lively audience. And I hope you enjoyed my socks. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>